Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Fernando Norato, the Chief Economist of Redesco. It is uh, our pleasure to have you all here today on behalf of our bank. Uh, it's really nice meeting you after this great day. We had uh, Olivia Blanchard uh, at, uh, at our lunch. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the investors here, uh, all the C-level investors, different Brazilian and Latin American com companies, uh, and, and joining us, not for this time, but for many years in a row. Uh, I hope every one of you enjoyed the meetings, and also I wish you a very productive conference uh, from uh, onwards. I'd like to welcome uh, Bradesco's chairman, uh, Mr. Luis Trabuco. He's probably just joined us. Bradesco's CEO, Otavio Lazari, right there. Uh, we have Bradesco's board of member, Mauricio Minas. We also have my colleagues here, uh, Marcelo Noronha, Guilherme, and uh, maybe one another that might be missing here, but we have all of them here on the stage. So, as you know, we have a very uh, distinguished uh, keynote speaker today. He has a very privileged view of the Brazilian economy at his current position. Not only because he's the, the, the chairman or the president of the Brazilian Central Bank, but he's the first one to push a transition or to be joining a transition of the new autonomous Brazilian Central Bank. This is a very different story for Brazil. I'm sure the political environment is benefiting a lot from having him at this time. Well, so I will I'll be moderating this panel with André Carvalho, the head of strategist here at uh, Bradesco BBI. So I would like to you to welcome uh, Roberto Campos here with us on the stage. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank Bradesco for uh, the opportunity. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, if any of you were like at the lead event, uh, sorry, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but the good news is we have graphs now, and this is in English, so at least there was a change. Um, but here, uh, trying to... Um, that's a message of, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a recap of what we have done, um, why we have done what we, we have done, uh, our understanding of the global scenario and how that impacts uh, what we will do in the future. And I will also talk about the digital agenda, uh, which, you know, um, it's been uh, getting a lot of attention lately and we have a lot of new things to come. So I will probably start... Uh, there is this huge debate uh, surrounding, you know, why is it that the central banks didn't see the persistent inflation from the very beginning? Why is it that, uh, why did did we get this wrong? Why, are, why were the models not able to predict inflation uh, in a way that it happened? Um, and here, there's two different stories. One is the understanding of what's happening from the beginning the effects of the joint uh, effort of doing huge fiscal package globally together with a uh, huge monetary effort in a coordination. Uh, remembering that uh, the fiscal package was a 9 trillion fiscal package on an 80 trillion economy. We have never seen that before. And then understanding after that why uh, we uh, couldn't adapt the supply in a way to make uh, inflation um, less severe. So uh, we go from the golden age of supply chains. We went into this long period uh, in which uh, we call now the, the golden age. I think we are going to a very important period in global history. I think these two years, that, that uh, last two years, will represent a change and an inflection point in the history uh, of the world for um, many things. And I'll, I'll point that out here. So we, we were in, in a period of you know free markets, cooperation, trade agreement. We can see that we had this huge demographic bonus. Uh, we were an increasing uh, community in terms of global trade and global value chains. And the global value chains were able to um, actually make a lot of emerging market countries grow and converge in terms of growth. But then at some point in time, cracks started to emerge. And I think the first cracks that, that we saw and paid no attention to it was the fact that productivity wasn't going higher. You look at globally, 
uh, production, productivity had stalled. And, and, and the interesting thing is every time we had productivity going lower, the government, especially in advanced economies, they got together and did a lot of reforms. Except that this time around, we had low productivity with low reforms. And we can see here that basically from the 19, from 2010 to now, we've done almost no reforms. There are some reforms in emerging market countries, but you only look at the, when you look at the red bar, it's almost non-existent. So the question is lower productivity and the governments were um, resisting or, or were lazy uh, to do reforms. I think that's a, one thing that's very important and explains part of what we're seeing now. But then the question is, why is it, why is it that these cracks didn't open before? Well, I think for one reason, we saw this huge uh, expansion in financing from low rates and low inflation um, that, that were driven from many factors. Uh, one of them was technology, the other one was the expanding financial markets. Um, the reality is the funding, the excess liquidity, the low rates, the leverage, and the expansion in, in, in capital markets kind of blurred a little bit the necessity to do reforms for a long time. Plus, on the top of that, the governments were kind of feeling that, you know, I can print money and inflation won't show up. If anything, I want inflation to show up, so I might as well just print a little bit of money and do a little bit of uh, spending here because, um, and, this and this became very popular uh, in the political class. But at some point in time, you know, the, the room to that was eroding and the debt levels were climbing. And I'm talking here even before, and you know, it is unrelated to the, to the Ukrainian crisis. Then there was a storm. Uh, we had the COVID, we had the war in Ukraine, um, and then we started to see this huge demand and increase, um, what the economists called the adaptability of supply was not there, and we showed why it was not there. There was no response to some, to some extent, and we started to see this uh, increase in the level of inflation. On the top of that, when you go back and look at what was done, and this, I think, probably one of the most important uh, graphs on the, on the presentation, because it explains why we had a different vision on the persistence of inflation from the very beginning. I would say that probably the most important graph is the one, uh, lower one on the left. Because it basically shows, if you imagine a trend line, you had this huge uh, dislocation in the demand for goods, which is not even close to the trend line. And we had this, uh, uh, shock in services and now is back into the trend line. So basically we had this dislocation of the demand for goods that produced the dislocation of the demand for energy. Remember in the producing goods consumes more energy. And then people started to estimate what's the effect on that. There was a work done by Fernanda Neck with the graph on the, on the right and the bottom, which was a director of the central bank and now works at the Fed, who basically shows the effect of, of, of the inflation with and without the fiscal package in the US. And you can see a huge effect on inflation. It's the difference between the green line and the blue line. So um, because economists in, in a way failed to see that there was a demand shock and everybody wanted to say, you know, it's mainly a supply coming from the mobility and the mobility will go back and the supply will be back. Now the new term is that it's not, there was not um, a problem in, in demand, there was not a shock in demand. What, what we had was supply was less adaptive, which is a nice way to say the same thing, basically. But the reality is we need to look at that. Uh, changes were accelerating, you know, we had a, a, a lot of different things. Um, we had the climate uh, transition on top of that. That I think made us in the central bank think from the very beginning, okay, this inflation is gonna be more persistent. One thing that actually called my attention in the middle of 2020 going to 21 was the fact that you had this location of demand for goods producing a demand for energy. And you see price of energy going higher and the capex going lower. And I hadn't seen that for a while. And a lot of things explain that. There was no funding for fossil fuel. There was a green transition. There was an inflation coming from the, um, the components of the green transition being more expensive. But that for me was a call that perhaps this is going to be more persistent. And we had many presentations, if you go and look in our older presentations, uh, that explain that. 
So again, you go and you see the demographic, uh, the, the demographic bonus is basically disappear. You look at the US uh, labor supply, there was actually a graph on that today in the, in the lead presentation done by Minister Levy. And then when we look at the, the green transitions, I think we also one of the first to have a, a slide in my presentation calling attention to what we call at the time the green inflation was basically the fact that everybody wanted to do the transition. There was a deceleration in funding from fossil fuel from fossil fuel that was much higher than the funding going into the green, uh, to the renewable energy. And again, we had this mismatch between price of energy and capex. You can see here the graph of oil, capex for oil, at the lowest when the price was at highest. So again, I think that was a call for us that um, you know, there, there was a call that, and we, we also look at, 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 the, at the supply, at the, at the excess reserves of oil, and they were very low from, from a long time. So the question is, what can be done? Uh, and, and, and we're still talking here on, we're still here on the global um, arena. So, I mean, the first message is, you know, fiscal framework have limits. Um, the, demand, the demand policies need to understand, you know, the conditions that we have now, supply is less adaptable. Um, it's like the, the, the supply is less elastic, uh, using a, a, terms that, a term that economists like. Um, we need to make sure that we have credibility in the fiscal framework. We need to advance in structural reforms. Again, the emerging market did some structural reforms in the last five years, but advanced economies did almost none. Um, and we need to think about policies to strengthen the supply side. What we need to understand right now is if we don't do this, uh, inflation is going to be more volatile because we are just seeing that the conditions that made supply very adaptable, like global value change, like the demographic bonus, cooperation technology, um, the, the transition the labor supply, this is all gone, which means that any shock now in demand will make inflation more volatile perhaps a little higher because the volatility means that the natural rate goes a bit higher too. Um, so we need to be cautious about inflation. And basically um, what the market is telling us, and we saw that in the event that happened in UK a couple of weeks ago, is basically that um, the agents are looking for governments to explain them how they're gonna pay the bill and not create new bills. And if you knew, if you do need to spend because a lot of people are still hurt from the pandemic, uh, you need to have an explaining. And one thing that's very important here to understand is that it's about uncertainty. So the more transparent I am about the way I'm going to spend, probably the more I can spend with the less harm because if you have less uncertainty, people are willing to understand the higher spending in the short term. Um, so we, we need to be careful not to do the opposite, which is to create a lot of uncertainty around it and then be limited by uh, the harm that the uncertainty is causing. I don't know if I made myself clear, but if not, we can go into Q&A after. And then one thing that also calls our attention is in the midst of all this um, questioning from the markets on how we're gonna get out of this high debt, you look at what country, countries are proposing in terms of ways out, and it's basically increasing taxes, but more than that, more than that, it, it's basically increasing taxes on capital. So if we go back, I just told you that the main problem was productivity, the first cracks I started to, uh, to appear when we understood that the productivity had stalled. And here I'm saying that the way out of this crisis is to put more taxes and more taxes in capital. If you put more taxes in capital, the return on the unit of capital goes lower and productivity goes lower. So again, you know, we need to solve that puzzle. That's probably a puzzle that will be with us and will have uh, repercussions for emerging markets. When you look in terms of global inflation, again, um, I think we are now seeing a bit of an inflection point in some places. It's too early to call, I think, in some other places. Um, we do see 
uh, inflation in emerging market Asia that was very behaved going a bit higher. And we do see like Latin America with uh, better numbers. Um, when we try to look at, you know, what are the forecasts uh, in terms of market expectation, we see that pretty much market expectation now has a very rational thinking. I'm thinking that because I see a deceleration in growth, I also see a lower inflation just around the corner. And that is, I think, something that we need to watch. Because the question is, what happens if we do have lower growth and high inflation for longer than what the market expects? That will have an implication for markets, especially for fixed income. When you look at uh, energy prices, again, um, you see the line, the blue line in Brazil with a very different pattern from the others. We have to recognize that most of the um, the lower, the surprise in terms of lower inflation compared to the beginning of the year in 2022 was due to government measures. But the question is, but are those measures exaggerated? And when we look in the bar graph on the right, we see that Brazil spent more or less uh, from average to lower than average in terms of measure measures to, um, to fight uh, energy and food prices. And here, there is one thing that's very important, which is, what's the best way to do this? This was a long debate that we had. And uh, in one of our meetings at the BIS, uh, we came up with the term 3T, which is temporary, targets, and tailor. So the best way to do measures is to make sure they are temporary, they are targeted, and they're tailored. Well, in the case of Brazil, every T is more, diff more difficult than the other, right? Beginning with temporary, which, you know, th temporary things tends to be uh, very permanent. So I think we need to understand that the, the more we explain this with transparency, the more room we have to actually implement it. When you look at headline inflation, again, uh, the headline CPI, I think we've, you all have seen these numbers, Brazil um, improving. Um, even outside the measures, the impact from the measures uh, that, that the government did, which was basically three, uh, lower taxes on um, oil, on gasoline, on telecom and electricity. Other than those measures, uh, we, see, we, see, we see some incipient signs that inflation is improving in terms of quality. Again, it's too early to call. It's very important for us to be focused on achieving the target. We have expressed that. Uh, we see some volatility now uh, due to the, trans to the transition of the government, and we need to, you know, keep uh, with our intention and our willingness to fulfill the mandate. U.S. inflation, again, I'm probably going to skip a little bit that. Uh, you saw the impact from uh, rent equivalent and all the sticky components that you have in the formation of inflation in the U.S., um, personally, we start to think that in terms of terminal rate in the U.S., we have seen the highest. Uh, we had one better number than expected in the U.S. It could be a beginning of a trend. We need to see. Um, there was reasons for us to believe that um, the, the tightening of the cycle still has some leg to go. But we think that in terms of expected terminal rate, we are probably um, close to uh, to the highest, uh, at least, unless we have a different and uh, new shock that we are not seeing now. In terms of monetary policy, we can see clearly um, that there's still some adjustments to be made when we think in terms of expected uh, rate. Uh, this has changed recently somewhat. Brazil, for example, that had an expected uh, cut is now um, even when you look at the short uh, term. Um, and even, even when you look at a longer uh, term, I think that has to do with the uncertainty regarding the fiscal package that is to be approved in Congress. Um, we talk a lot about that on the, on the event uh, earlier today. I won't um, talk too much about fiscal. It's not the job of the central bank, but I need to point out that this is going to be very relevant in terms of convergence. In terms of activity, I think, again, uh, the question is how you want to look at it, but everywhere you look, you see deceleration. U.S., there is almost a sure deceleration. We don't know 
what is the size of that? We don't know the impact on the labor force, which is, I think, something that we need to understand uh, more clearly. But we are seeing the effect on China, some other countries in Asia, Europe. So basically, we are saying that 2023, we will face a deceleration globally. Uh, we will face higher uh, a part of the impact of the policy that we did in 2022. And for that reason, we've been saying that we think growth in Brazil will also decelerate. I won't talk too much about China. Uh, it's still very uncertainty. They also have a mix uh, of um, different issues happening at the same time. We have the, you know, the, the housing market, which has a lot of question marks. You have the embargo that the US has on technology that people don't talk too much about it, but I think it's highly relevant for China. Um, uh, we can go a little bit more uh, on Q&A if you have questions on that. I've, I've read a lot about this embargo on technology. I think this is very, very relevant and amazingly, I don't see it, um, and I don't see it very um, in, in a lot of um, the, the channels. In terms of forecasting GDP, Brazil is probably the only country that had a higher forecast. Again, we need to look at that uh, and understand that part of this was higher commodity prices, part of this was the measures taken by the government, but the fact is we begin to think in Brazil that some of the things that we are seeing in terms of the surprise are coming from supply. In other words, a lot of the reforms that were done uh, in the last years, beginning in, 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 in the uh, government uh, Temer and expanding into the last four years, we start to think that this is having a little bit of an effect, very difficult to show, very difficult to prove, but I think in the labor market, you see signs of that. And um, we, we are now studying that effect. This graph that I like a lot, which is basically what I call a balanced portfolio, because I think this is one thing that gives me an input uh, for uh, what I think we are seeing, we are going to see a, a faster deceleration from here on. This is basically the performance of a, a portfolio, which is 60% um, income, 60% 60 real uh, fixed income and 40% equity. And you can see here on the dots that the, basically you've had the worst performance ever. Um, you had years like 1931 and some, but I mean, uh, I think it, it stands out when you look at the bar graph, you can see the red bar. This is a huge wealth effect, perhaps with a bit less leverage and less intense that we saw in 2008, but I think that has a huge implication on the financial conditions. And to some extent, we think that this is not perfectly captured today in the way people measure the financial conditions. Also, uh, something that I like to look a lot, which is uh, comparing macro volatility with the equity fundamentals, and you can see um, the, the, the blue, um, the, the dark blue going over the light blue. Uh, it happened in the stagnation of the, se the 70s. Then we had the, the period in which this reversed, which we call great moderation. And we're seeing now for some time that this is pointing to the same direction. One other thing that we like to look at is the volatility of the treasury, and we can see what happens there. We clearly now have a problem in the liquidity in the long end of fixed income in a lot of different places. And even in sovereign, which you know, used to be very liquid, we started to see, um, there was a, you know, a big debate on that, uh, even amongst central bankers. Well, the, the effect on, 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 uh, on mortgage, I think here is very important to understand the difference uh, in, in, from different countries in terms of how much you have in terms of floating rate in mortgage. When you look at Australia, for example, it's highly concentrating on flooring, flooring rates, which, which means that when you increase rates, you have a different effect, a uh, much stronger effect that you have in some other places. And you can see the sensitivity of that now uh, being played out. And you can see in the way central bankers have behaved and part of, I think, uh, part of the reason is the explanation. Part of the explanation is this. Uh, we are seeing more sensitivity in some places than others. Um, what happened in UK? I think that's very vivid in the memory of everyone here. Um, probably the first time that I see um, an advanced economy being treated like an emerging markets in response to a fiscal program. 
Um, also, um, I think it raised a flag for us central bankers in a way uh, that showed us that in reality it's very difficult for us central bankers to understand and measure nonlinear risk. It's very easy for central bankers to know linear risk, and it's very easy to look at the balance sheet of banks, but it's very difficult to measure nonlinear risks. And the reality today is that we have pockets of risks outside the banking system, the nonlinear risk outside the banking system that is very difficult for us to capture and is very difficult to measure. And the problem is those uh, pockets of risks, nonlinear risk outside the banking system, have a link with the banks because there's lending involved in the formation of some of these companies. I can go on and on here because I have studied that recently, but I think, you know, being a trader, you know that you can do a combination of products and create non-linearity and probably your risk department won't be able to catch it. Very difficult to, uh, very difficult to measure, okay? Uh, when you look in terms of bottlenecks, um, you see some improvement, but um, it's very, very segmented. Um, again, I think one of the risks that we face today, which is not very much talked about, is the pressure on semiconductors. We have this embargo on China. We have a huge uh, concentration uh, in Taiwan, and we have a lot of geopolitical things uh, on the top of that. This, I think, you know, reflects a little bit what I said. Um, you can see the dependency that we have on sem some kinds of semicondu semi semiconductors from Taiwan. You see the dependency on importance, and you see what happened to the index. Um, here, we, we try to do a, an exercise. We don't have uh, all the data. But if you had something on Taiwan, the effect on the economy probably would be much worse than COVID because everything today runs on semiconductors. And uh, when we stop and think, you know, we central bankers, we were not very good in terms of stress testing, uh, you know, scenarios that are outside uh, the banking uh, risk, the banking traditional risk. I mean, it was very difficult for us to stress test the effects on the pandemic. Then it was very difficult to stress test the effects on energy. Uh, and we need to remember that Germany sold a gas plant to Russia one year before the invasion. So, I mean, very difficult to stress these things. And now I don't think people are stressing tests correctly, the risk that we have from semiconductors. Um, this has become my favorite graph lately, the one on the left, which is basically the difference between the inflation in Brazil and an average of advanced economies in the last 20 years. And basically shows that the inflation in the years of 14, 15, and 16 was mainly a Brazilian uh, manufactured inflation. Whereas when we look at now, it's the opposite. We have a much lower inflation compared to the average uh, historically than advanced economies. And I think you know this reflects a bit uh, the work that we have done in the central bank, have, reflects the credibility that the central bank has gained in the last um, years with my predecessors. And I think uh, when you look at uh, what the market expects, and we can look at the triangles here on the, on, on the top, on the right, and compare to the gray bars, and you can see that most of the triangles are way out there over the gray bars, which means that the expected inflation for 2023 is much higher than the interval. And in the case of Brazil, um, is on the top of the interval. We need to make sure that we continue our job uh, to fulfill the mandate and to make the inflation in the long end uh, re-anchor. This is just a statement for a cash for growth. I won't concentrate too much on that. Uh, we've had an improvement in, in the forecast for growth. Again, I think we're gonna have a deceleration for next year. The labor market also has been highly, uh, you know, has been highly publicized the improvement that we had in the labor market. Again, I think part of it is due to some of the reforms that were done. We are trying to work on how to uh, connect these things. Um, we think most of the improvement in the labor force now is behind us. 
that we need to um, keep watching. Um, but this is a, a sector uh, or, you know, uh, this is an index and a number that has surprised us many times. I think the fiscal is the name of the game right now. I won't talk too much about it. Uh, we did some simulations, uh, very important. Um, I think we've, I've seen many, many works doing all kinds of simulation, depending on what is the pack that will be approved. Um, and, uh, sorry. And basically we did a bit of a, an, uh, you know, a bit of a simulation here too, which basically is com compares the, uh, the, what we had before with what's being proposed. We are just considering one year, one year now. Um, it's very important to have coordination between uh, fiscal and monetary policy. We have expressed that many times in our official communication. Um, and we understand that it's very important to have a look for the social. We understand that. I mean, we do need to address that, especially after the pandemic. But we also need to do that with fiscal responsibility. And the result is that inflection point in which doing more means achieving less even for the people that you want to help. Because if you lose credibility, you start having an effect from uh, un unorganizing prices, a disorganization of prices in markets, and that affects uh, the way people invest and produce, and that will actually mean at the end of the day, lower jobs and lower growth. So it's very important to be able to um, equate these two things. Uh, going back a, a bit on, on, on our technology agenda. I think this presentation I've done over and over, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, everybody knows what's happening in the digital world. We are having uh, this movement of trying to extract value from a digital uh, from a digital interpretation of assets. We are monetizing assets in a digital way. So we are seeing, even though we have had you know a very rough ride in terms of the cryptos and some of what's happening in the in the technology industry. I think the distributed ledgers are here to stay. I think the tokenization is here to stay. And we think this uh, way of doing things in terms of token and tokens and in, in terms of digital platforms are here to stay. I think we think the real debate is we are moving to a tokenized economy. We want to make sure that we are close to that. There is a big divergence between uh, central banks. Some central banks think that the way to do it is to make sure banks don't uh, have custody of digital assets. And we think just the opposite. We think the way to do it is to make sure that banks are getting into this tokenization um, tendency and that they can actually um, be custodians of digital assets if they want, because we think this is a way to bring that closer to the regulated system. So again, I'm gonna go a bit fast here. Um, we think it's 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 only the beginning. Um, we have seen now some exercises of what would happen in in uh, in in a theoretical bank in which assets and liabilities are tokens, and we start to have a gain in efficiency in the back office in the risk analysis. You can actually have multiple settlements. Um, you can have cheaper financial intermediation. You can have cheaper credit. So there's a lot of effects coming from that. Um, so, you know, PIX, I think, has become very, uh, you know, popular what we're doing. We have more things to add to PIX. We have new functionalities. Um, we have an agenda. We have PIX just uh, just uh, made two years. Uh, we need now to revisit all the, the gains that we had and to create an agenda for the next two years. We have new features to be added. The open finance is already uh, working. Again, for us, um, this is all done to this uh, lift uh, challenge that we have, which is our lab. Uh, we like to do it with projects from the private, uh, the private sector. And basically, the, 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 place, uh, the, the convergence of everything that we do in terms of our digital agenda is these four blocks coming together, which is open finance, um, the CBDC, the internationalization of the currency and the PIX, which is basically, it's more than PIX. It's a, it's a trail, it's a rail, sorry, in which you can do instant payments, but you can also program things on it. So you can do credit, you can have smart contracts, you can program things that are gonna be linked to open finance. So the link between PIX and open finance 
uh, will be greater and greater from now on. And I think this is what sometimes people don't see. This is also an old thing that I did from the Febraban meeting. Uh, I think I thought about an aggregator in which you have everything working together and you can see that you can go into one app and you can actually have your financial life um, concentrated in a way that you can see everything um, with much more transparency. And you can have competition online from the products, you can do picks, you can have the digital wallet, you're gonna have what you call the investment bank cash management for, 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 um, for the general population. Um, you can actually schedule flows. You're gonna have a connection to the data wallet so that people can monetize their data. And also we are thinking about the way of doing an offline so that people can use that even without connection. The sustainability agenda also we have been working. I was just talking um, to some people on how we can improve our carbon market. We are working on a taxonomy right now. It's very difficult. At the end, uh, the central bank uh, decided to be in charge of that project because we need a taxonomy to develop the carbon market. I think one of the inefficiencies that we have is we are not we have not been able to um, convince people to convince um, the global players that it's very important to remove the asymmetry that we have today so that we can actually monetize the, the, the native forest. Today is very asymmetric. If you have a piece of land and you plant trees, you get credit. But if you just conserve, you don't get credit. We need to remove to diminish this asymmetry. I was just talking uh, about that on the other meeting. This is it. Thank you so much. I think we have time for Q&A. I hope I don't extend myself too much. Thank you, Governor. Uh, it's true that one of the most important social policies in Brazil is to bring inflation down, insist in, in that uh, job. Uh, there is a question here about the labor market in Brazil, your assessment about the labor market. We have been seeing uh, job creation to decelerate in Brazil. So there are signs that the unemployment rate may be bottoming soon and wages are recovering. I uh, would like to hear your views on that. Sorry. No, it, it's um, you're right. So there are signs that there are, there are signs that, that this movement is bottom. Um, but the labor market has been a surprise in many different countries. And there is this talk in every meeting that I go in the BIS and talk to other central bankers. There is this talk about is there something happening structurally to the labor supply? Um, in the case of Brazil. Um, Brazil actually stands out because we created more jobs than any country um, in G20 during the pandemic. More recently, you started to see, and there was a presentation on that done by, I think, uh, uh, Levy today in the other meeting, which basically shows that something that we have been saying for a while, which is we started to see um, people with more education um, being more benefited uh, in terms of getting jobs. Um, the more education you have, the less is the unemployment is starting to revert. When you look at the real, the mass in terms of real income is starting to go higher. But at the same time, you have signs that the total, uh, the total employment seems to be um, start to reverse a little bit. Uh, obviously, um, when you look at the effects that we that we have for next year, you have a global effect that means lower growth. We have China, which is a question mark. We have US, which is basically going to be in a recession. Um, we have a lot of the, the rate increases that we did in Brazil that are going to take effect next year. So we have all these uh, variables that are pointing us to the fact that we're going to see a deceleration. So it's normal that we started to see uh, a bottoming, uh, 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 the, the label bottoming. But, but we think uh, the important thing is to look at the quality of the data in labor and not so much the number anymore. We need to understand. Uh, what are the segments that are being uh, employed and the, the ones that are being that are not? And we need to calibrate the social policies uh, looking at what's happening structurally in the labor supply. Oh, great. Thank you, Roberto. So just, just to let you know, uh, there's a QR, QR code in your, in your uh, table. So if you want to send us questions, just photograph that and please uh, just send us. So, Roberto, I know <laughs> you've been a little bit hesitant talking about a fiscal policy, I'm sure, and I understand the reasons. But a lot lots of 
Oh, you see, talking about fiscal policy, they cut my mic. Uh, so lots of questions coming about fiscal policy. So let's just talk theoretically. Uh, what would you think would be uh, a framework for the next few years in Brazil that would help your job to bring inflation to the center of the target? Again, we're not talking about details, whether it's a spending cap, another 100 billion, 200 billion. But theoretically, what type of predictability would be useful for the central bank to uh, address the, the, the medium term inflation target? Well, at the end, the end game is the trajectory of the debt, right? So you have all these rules in place and you can go one way or the other way. But at the end, what's going to matter is, you know, what is the expectation of the trajectory of your debt? And here, again, removing uncertainty is very important. So sometimes you can spend more if you have less uncertainty because people know what you're going to do and how you plan to pay it. Um, I think having increase in expenditures without explaining how this is going to be paid generates uncertainty and creates a higher cost in terms of credibility um, than otherwise. Um, I think some of these programs have to have um, exits or explain how you're going to exit. I think uh, programs in which um, are made permanent from the start, once you made a, a program permanent from the start, there is less of an incentive to revise every year. And if you don't revise it, you don't improve it. So I think it's important to, uh, to do that. Um, but at the end, again, uh, when we look at, at the literature, the important thing is to have the what we call the three T, right? It's targeted, temporary, and tailored. And it's very difficult to do that. Temporary is difficult. Uh, tailor is very difficult because at the end it takes a long time and you want to do it because you know people are suffering a lot right now. Uh, and the target is also very you know, questionable. So again, the important thing is the trajectory of the debt. We need to uh, make sure that whatever we do, the economic agents will look at that and will see that our explanation makes sense in a way that we are going to converge the trajectory of debt to a level of debt that is reasonable uh, for the investors. Uh, that, that's impressive. Just a second, Andre, because we had Olivia Blanchard in our, in our lunch meeting, and he said he was drawing about the UK example. And he said mm -hmm. exactly the same three T's you mentioned. He said, well, markets were understanding that the UK would need to support poor people mm -hmm. with the energy bill. But they were not understanding why they would spend much more than that or cutting mm -hmm. taxes for rich people. So that's impressive. When we saw the reaction of markets last week in Brazil, the GI curve, for example, you, you touched up on that on your presentation. Uh, it's it's a clear sign that there is that is this uncertainty in in the corner. Right. Roberto, there is a question here about the effectiveness of monetary policy in Brazil. The Brazilian central bank was one of the first to start hiking rates in the world. And uh, there is a lag, right? So we started last year and it's finally impacting the economy. I would like to hear your views about this lag. When do you think the biggest impact will happen and the channels, especially bank lending? It's, it's a, I'm, I'm laughing because this is something that was very polemical in one of the meetings with other central banks. Because the reality is um, the behavior of the market towards advanced economy um, are beginning to be very similar to what we have in emerging markets, right? Uh, and so for me, you know, for us, it's a bit natural, but sometimes you talk to other central bankers and they are always surprised. And um, the reality is when you have more uncertainty, so your models are not predicting inflation correct, you're not getting the numbers right, you are communication with errors all the time. Basically, when that starts to happen, it's natural that you think about the boundaries, so every central bank will think about the boundaries. If, they, if he's getting things wrong for a long time, he's going to think, okay, what are the boundaries? And there's always the two boundaries. You can only do you can only do two things. You can do too much and realize you could have done the job creating less harm to the economy. And otherwise, you can raise too much and realize you could have done it better. Or you can do too little and then inflation the anchor. And then you have to go back into adjusting rates with a high cost and credibility. So you have these two kinds of mistakes. When you are a central banker from an emerging market, you avoid to do number two, because you know that if you do too little and you have to go back, it's gonna cost a lot in terms of credibility. In the case of Brazil, probably you have to put the country in a recession. So we have a high, you, you avoid having this kind of mistake. But the funny thing is, 
what we realize now is that even for advanced economies, when you are late and you are ha you've been having a lot of mistakes and your credibility starts to be contested, you have uh, right now, a lot of the advanced economies have the same behavior emerging markets. So they think, okay, I don't want to do this mistake. I prefer to do too much because I have already missed some of the targets. My models are getting wrong. So now, as opposed to before, you have both emerging markets and advanced economy thinking, no, oh, I prefer to have the mistake uh, type two, which is I prefer doing too much and realizing that I could have done with a little less. But if that happens, I can always go back into lower rates. So this is very, very interesting because going back to your question, until recently, interestingly enough, you would read the statements from many central banks and you wouldn't see the word lag. Up until like a month ago, you wouldn't see the word lag. Why do you think that is? Well, if you're getting things wrong from a long time, all of a sudden you realize that you have to time your adjustment because the reality is it's very difficult for a central bank that is making a lot of mistakes to stop hiking when you're still having surprises on inflation in the short term. This used to be very common for us, but not very common for advanced economies. So the reason why I left is because now this is becoming more of a um, this global issue. Um, but I think in terms of Brazil, we have explained uh, that we've done a lot, uh, that we think what we have done is, is, is sufficient. Uh, we are looking at the quality of the last numbers of inflation. You started to see, for example, in the core services, the numbers are a bit better. Some of the items that were very, very high from a long time, like clothing, you started to see decreasing. So we are looking at the quality of number. You have incipient signs that is improving, but I think it's too early to call the victory. Um, and so we remain very watchful, uh, very mindful that you know we need to uh, have a clear message to investors that we are going to fulfill our mandate one way or the other, and that now we have a transition, and we need to watch what what are, what's the fiscal framework that we're going to have and take that as an input in our model and see how that's going to impact our projection for next year. I was also laughing while we were saying, because one of our clients just, just uh, it's, it's, you already answered, but said, having lived through many crises, which advice would you give to the American Central Bank as it enters a period of recession and high inflation? So that, that, that's what we were saying. The skills to fight inflation are here in America, here in Brazil. So... I'm just very briefly moving to the global economy. Uh, in the, the last uh, couple of minutes, you said that the global environment is a little bit ambiguous for Brazil. In one sense, it has low commodity prices. In the other hand, it could harm uh, asset prices. But uh, all we know, it's to us, it seems uh, a little bit more directional in the sense that the Brazilian health is the best performing currency in the world. And I'd love to hear your views. Why do you think the Brazilian currency has outperformed other currencies if, if any one of us was, was to say the Fed would tighten to five, we would expect Brazilian health to be uh, undervalued, it's not. And, and uh, with that in mind, with the, the good performance of the currency, don't you think the global environment is benefits Brazilian inflation from now onwards? I think people tend to look at two dimensions, which is basically, okay, if the world decelerates, you have two effects. On one side, commodities will go lower, and that will impact your inflation positively. But probably that will mean a negative uh, shock for Brazil in terms of trade. And so your FX can devalue. And maybe the devaluation effect can outweigh the effect uh, on lower commodity prices. Well, I think there is a third dimension to that, which is today uh, the market expects growth to be lower and inflation to be lower just around the corner. Um, but then the question is, what happens if we have a binomial of higher inflation and lower growth for longer. And what if that creates um, a discontinuity in markets? I, I think there is this third dimension because that would have an effect of raising risk premium and that's going, that would affect Brazil negatively. So I think this, there is more than the two natural dimensions. I think there is a third one which can come from markets. I think markets have been very resilient if you told me that the terminal rate in the U.S. would project 520 last year, I would probably have told you, okay, we are going to see a huge correction in markets. We have seen some correction, but in an organized way, 
we haven't seen any discontinuity. Um, but so I would probably answer you saying that there's just three, three dimensions. The two ones that are traditional and this third one, which I still think we are not out of the woods yet, which is how markets behave if we keep having lower growth and higher inflation. In other words, if inflation is not, uh, doesn't go lower as the market expects. Sure. There is a question here asking you uh, your views about the household leverage and the NPL's performance. Uh, we have been seeing NPL's uh, increasing mm -hmm. since 2021, uh, so probably very close to the peak of NPL's in Brazil, but would like to hear your views on that. Yes, yeah, something that we debated last week. In fact, when you look at NPL's in Brazil, they are going higher. Um, there is a change in the mix of products, so you need to adjust for that. Um, but there are some signs uh, of comfort. First one is when you stress test the balance sheet of the banks, they're very healthy. The second one is when you look at how spreads are behaving with the higher interest rates, they are going higher, but much less than they would have been otherwise proportionally. In other words, if you imagine that rates were at what they are now a while ago, you would imagine spreads to be much higher. So there is signs uh, that either the competition is working or the segmentation is working, or you have this new mix of products that the bank the banks have found that are uh, that have been able to um, contain spread to some extent. So I think there is the bad side and the good side of the story. Um, I think we need to look at the product mix, and we are seeing that some of the products that are more like emergency credit, I started to be in higher demand, and those are the ones that you know uh, give us a red alert. But again, uh, in terms of financial stability, when we stress test the banks, and the, the, the bank, the banking system is in a sound shape. Uh, we look at the non-bank activities to date, and also because it's very important, and we don't see any meaningful risk from that. So we understand the higher NPLs. Uh, we understand that's in part an effect from uh, from the higher rates, but I think overall the, the system is, is sound. Out of the cycle, right? Yes, part of the cycle. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, I think what we learned during this, this the current moment is that high food inflation was hurting and PLs was hurting families mm -hmm. balance sheet. So if you take a look, for example, minimum wages uh, uh, deflated by CPI or IPCA, it's flat, absolutely. But if you deflate by food price, it's yeah. much, it's much uh, uh, lower. Well, let's change a little bit here to talk about Brazilian central bank uh, digital currencies, so or digital currency. Uh, what do you, what are the main benefits you believe we could have for the for the economy for the mm -hmm. people, and uh, what is in your schedule the next uh, two years or so? Yeah, this is also an issue that's highly debatable, uh, debated, um, and. Uh, Again, our view is a bit different uh, from uh, most central banks there. Um, the real question in designing a CBDC was how can I do it in a way that it doesn't hurt the ability of banks to do credit, right? So I don't wanna have asset uh, liability um, of uh, digital currencies in the balance of the central bank. And so that was a question that was around for a long time, it was you know issue for debate every time we got together. And um, very difficult to answer that. If you have a huge money market, like in the US, you can say that base, that your base effect from uh, this erosion will be smaller. But that's not true for most uh, economies and most emerging market countries. So for us, it was about finding a way uh, that uh, introduced efficiency to the banks and not hurt the banks in terms of the base effect or um, for doing credit. And then all of a sudden we realized that, you know, what is it, you know, the question is, what is the question you're trying to solve for? And for us, the question we're trying to solve for is efficiency. And we think efficiency will come from um, digitalizing, from tokenizing assets and liabilities. So we think about all the trouble that this, um, uh, that, that is involved in creating a digital currency by blocking issuance at the central bank. And we thought, okay, there's a much easier way to do that. We are just going to tokenize the deposits of the banks. So the banks will be able to issue stable coins on their deposits. 
Why is this much easier? Well, for first, um, the regulation around issuing a CBDC is very complex. And if I do that, the regulation, uh, you just inherit the regulation from deposits because you're just doing a tokenized deposits. The other thing is I actually give an incentive for banks to uh, start tokenizing assets. I think that, ha that will have a, a long lasting impact on the way banks control risk, on the way you do settlement, on the way you do like back office activities. I think the financial intermediation cost will go lower. Um, the settlement can be atomized and multiplied many folds if you have a, to a tokenized system. Uh, you can do uh, instant settlement with instant guarantee. The controlling of the guarantees in a DLT is much more efficient than a no non-token uh, way. So we see a lot of gains in efficiency in the balance sheet of the banks. And we think at the end of the day, um, when the banks become custodian of digital assets, then we can truly have a system uh, of digitalization that can grow without harm. Because one of the things that I always was um, worried about was that when you look at the cryptos, the custody was highly, highly concentrated. And I remember a meeting of a year and a half ago at the Treasury in Washington. And I said, you know, this is very, very interesting. You have 60% of all the assets being uh, uh, in custody of two companies, and we don't regulate them, and we don't know what is the ratio of liquidity that they have. And we learned last week that the ratio was not so good, right? One of them uh, went belly up. And, and, and the reality is, um, I think you need to have a diversification in the custody. I think that's one what was one of the biggest dangers. And the other thing is if you are doing brokerage and you start creating currencies, um, it's like when you create ATFs, right? Everything is fine when the underlying assets have liquidity. But then when they don't, you start opening positions because you are selling something that you don't have one for one. And I could go more technical on that, but I don't want to. But I think that's pretty much uh, what we saw happening last week. Um, so, you know, I, I thought about that actually last year. And I think the system that we need to design is the system that will bring that closer to us and not um, to uh, put them away uh, in terms of this uh, revolution. And again, it's not about crypto. Uh, it's about the technology. I think a lot of cryptos will come and go, but the technology, the tokenization, I think is going to stay and is going to improve the efficiency of the financial system. That makes a lot of sense. Andra, maybe one or two final questions. So there, is a, there are two questions here, actually, uh, asking about the new players that came to the banking system recently and asking you uh, about the contribution of the Brazilian Central Bank uh, for higher competition in credit, lower risks related to MPLs, and financial inclusion in Brazil. If I have a very small compliment about TLP, the new BNDS rate, uh, in this agenda of competition and allowing markets to be more, more free. Okay. So I, I was just mentioning um, one of the things that we do believe is that... Uh, the lowering of the subsidized credit uh, in, in a way contributed to a lower uh, neutral rate. And there was, a, I think, a work done by Fabio Kanchuk recently on that. Um, we have looked at that. Um, it's, it's somewhat debatable because some of the assumptions you know, are debatable, but I think at the end, we have a clear, uh, we have a clear view of the direction, right? So it would be a pity to go back to, because that would probably mean raising natural rates, right? Uh, and we don't want to do that. In terms of the, the, the competition, um, for us, it's about uh, inclusiveness, right? So we think the biggest instrument for democratization of the financial system is technology. So we have been working on making sure that we have a lower barrier of entry for uh, platforms, because we think that's a way to uh, first generate segmentation and second generate innovation in the industry. And I think we have seen a lot of that. 
Um, again, I don't think it's about transferring. I think it's about making the pie bigger for everyone. I remember a very vivid debate on PIX in the very beginning. And I think today, if the banks put the numbers together, they actually make money with PIX. And they will make more because PIX will be a platform for credit, right? So um, at the end, some of these innovations, um, it, it, it takes a while for you to see uh, what is the effect on the long term. And even for us, I mean, we are surprised by PIX too. And once you start doing like like any innovation project, you know how it begins, but you know how you don't know how it ends because as you do it, you start realizing that I can do this new thing and I can actually fix this other product or the other problem. Um, but again, I think it, for us, it's about inclusiveness. It's about segmentation, competition. But again, more than that, we want to in increase the pie uh, for everyone. So we want to include people in the financial system. And I think we have done that. Um, nine million, I, the, the number that I had from last week was nine million people open bank accounts just to have picks. We have, I think, I don't remember the number of companies, but it's very high uh, that started doing. So again, it's about generating inclusiveness and increased participation in the financial system. Yes, just an doctor. We see people in the streets that's asking for donation through PIX. It's, in, it's impressive. So the type of inclusion you can have. Well, Roberto, we know you have to fly back today or, or in coming hours. So I would just like to thank you a lot for your time here. Uh, the audience is certainly really uh, grateful for, for your mentioning too here, for your presentation. If you'd like to add any final comments, if not, I'd just like you to, to say thank you very much. Oh, I just want to thank you uh, for everyone. Say, saying that, that uh, as you said in the very beginning, uh, we have now a moment in which the autonomy of the central bank will be tested. The central bank uh, um, will be willing, obviously, to work with the new government uh, to find, you know, um, I think we need to look ahead and, and find solutions um, for uh, Brazil. We need to go back into a higher growth, a more stable growth. We need to find a way uh, to do this uh, um, privately, but we cannot forget um, the social. So again, it's about finding balance. But I think, again, we need to do that, removing uncertainty. Creating uncertainty actually makes your cost much, much higher. You can do actually bigger things if you have less uncertainty with lower costs. So I think that would be probably my final message. And, um, you know, ask everyone to keep believing and to keep investing. Thank you very much. Thank you.